It is Wednesday afternoon at 1.30. That means it's time for The Hope Within. My name is William Hemsworth, and I thank you all for joining me on this great Wednesday afternoon. Uh, Hope Within is a radio program about Christian apologetics, uh, talking about topics to help you defend the faith and to share the gospel in a more effective manner. And here at The Hope Within, we get we get our name from 1 Peter 3.15, which says... But in your heart set apart Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everything, to everyone who asks you to give a reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. So a couple housekeeping items real quick before we get started with today's program, which is about atheism, by the way. Uh, Check out my website, theologystillmatters.com. We've got a couple new articles out there. You can check out back, back episodes of the show. We have book reviews, different articles about the Christian faith in there. Just great stuff. Great resource for you. I put it up there all for free. One other piece of housekeeping. On my website is a link to my Amazon author page. My book, Life in Christ, Essays on the Christian Life, is on sale. I call it a fire sale because it's on sale for $2.83 for the paperback. So for less than $3, you get 104 pages of Christian apologetics, church history, and theology, all at your fingertips. Great resource there, only $2.83, and of course shipping is free if you're a Prime member. Now as I said just a couple seconds ago, today's topic is about atheism. And this kind of stems from a question I got last week about faith. Um, Basically, a listener who raised her son in the faith is now an atheist. And she wants to know, you know, kind of what the atheists believe, how to answer atheism. And I'm going to go through it briefly. Of course, the show is only a half hour long. There's no way to debunk everything in atheism in that amount of time. So I'm just going to give an overview, just to give a brief overview of some of the key aspects that we can discuss with our atheist friends. So as many of you know, atheism is a belief that is growing by leaps and bounds in our country and it's growing exponentially across the world. It's simply a belief that says that there is no God. And that's actually the literal definition of atheism. It means without God. And it can be divided up into two parts. One is there's a strong type of atheist that says there's no God and is not open to the possibility of it without powerful evidence to sway their opinion. Then there are others who say there's no God, but they're open to the possibility. And most people in that second category, most of the time may even fall into agnosticism, meaning they think there may be a God, they're not sure if it's the Christian God, the Islam God whatever the case is either way atheism has had a has had a resurgence in recent years in fact guys i don't know if you've noticed they're even advertising to gain adherence to their belief so one popular organization is the freedom from religion foundation and they spend millions of dollars in advertising to convince the public that something does not exist so just let that sink in Atheists are spending millions of dollars in billboards, radio ads, social media ads, etc. to convince you that something does not exist. So in the past, atheists respected the beliefs of Christians and other religions, and some still do today, but the the mainstream atheists like Richard Dawkins and so forth, that's to them that's a bygone area, bygone era. They want to attack Christianity. Christianity is under attack. And this assault is being being led by prominent members of atheism, which some theologians call the Four Horsemen. Now, theologian Scott Hahn, in his book Answering Atheism, says, quote, The Four Horsemen, Richard Dawkins, Sam Harris, Christopher Hitchens, and Daniel Denner, have assumed the leadership of a growing Anglo-American movement, releasing volley after volley of bestsellers and DVDs into the Christian culture. So the major worldview of atheists 
and in particular secular humanists, is that human reason is the pinnacle, the apex of all thought and morals. They'll never be with our highest form of life on earth and evolve from other species. And since there is no God, the goal of life is to be happy and productive in the world. And there's nothing wrong with that. Since the meaning of life is self-determined, it can vary greatly from person to person, and that's where the conflict comes in. Morals also vary among each person and are determined by reason and one's cultural norms. In this worldview, absolute morals do not exist, because they may vary widely among individuals. But norms such as stealing, murder, rape, and child molestation are looked on as evil. In atheism, everyone is looked on as being good, and there's no reason to have a God who says that everyone is inherently evil or sinful. There is, a, there, there is evil in the world because we fail to look after each other. Now, these objections will be categorized, and I'm going to categorize these into, the, into three questions. One, why is there evil in the world? Two, from where do we derive our morals, and are there moral absolutes? And three, does God exist? So what I want to do in the course of this program, like I said at the top, is just to provide a summary, just a review of the atheistic worldview, and we've done part of that already. So when it comes to discussing the faith with atheists, it's important to do so in love. Just as the scripture right at the top of the program says. Too often us Christians break down and say that everyone who's an atheist is stupid. Now, that's definitely not the way to go. As the old saying goes, we catch more bees with honey instead of vinegar. In fact, Proverbs 15.1 says something similar. That passage of scripture says, A gentle answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word steers up anger. So why is there evil in the world? When atheists express their disapproval of theism, one of two things are normally brought up. They may say things like, There is no God. Because, the, because there's no evidence to support his existence. Or there is no God, because a good God would not allow evil things to happen. So what I want to do briefly is deal with the problem of evil. And we'll talk about evidence for God a little later on. Now, to deny, ev- to deny that evil exists would to make a mockery of our God-given intellect and our ability to reason. Guys, all we have to do is turn on the evening news, or even a different radio station for that matter, or or Facebook, Twitter. That's all we have to do is turn on one of those mediums to see evil play out almost everywhere. One wants to know if religion has belief in God who does evil or fails to do good. The argument states that if God is a good God, why are there wars, disease, and something something of the like? From a Christian perspective, there are right ways and wrong ways to answer this question. A bad answer is to say that the, is to say this very popular phrase, God works in mysterious ways. Now to us believers, there's a lot of truth in this statement. But we have to remember that we're talking with someone who does not have a belief in the existence of God. Now in his book, Answering Atheism, Trent Horn writes, No serious theist believes that God desires the suffering of people on earth just so he can watch them suffer. Rather, God uses the suffering in our lives because he desires the greater good that can come from such suffering. Another way to approach the subject is to ask what evil is. Now, evil can be distinguished into two parts. There is a moral evil, which is something, which is someone reacting against what is good. Then there is natural evil, which is when bad effects flow from morally good or non-moral causes. 
So moral evil is anything that is against God. That would include acts such as murder, rape, abortion, cheating, stealing, lying. Natural evil is caused by the choices of people. So this brings up a question. The question must be asked to the atheist. Which evil should we get rid of? Because we can't pick and choose which evils should stay. If God were to eliminate all evil in the world, then that includes us. And the human race would fail to exist. Moral and natural evils cannot be attributed to God because he did not create them. The choices we make have a type of a ripple effect that we may not be aware of or comprehend at the time that we're doing that act. In fact, the final effect may not be apparent for several years. Human beings were made in God's image, which includes the possession of free will. However, if God's creation chose to do evil, does that mean that he's responsible for it? You see, guys, we're not robots. Human beings are not robots that God built with some predetermined program. Everything that the person did was done of his own free will and accord. If we did not have free will, then the good things that are done would have no meaning. The charity displayed to the less fortunate, teaching, being a loving parent, or just being a nice human being, will be the norm and nothing special. Yes, there is definitely evil in the world. And my duty and yours is to make it less and less. Is to make sure there's less evil in the world than when we first came in. However, there's much more good in the world than evil. And that's a credit to our creator. See, Augustine, in his treatise entitled On the on Free Will, wrote... For a runaway horse is better than a stone that stays in the right place only because it has no movement or perception of its own. And in the same way, a creature that sins by free will is more excellent than one that does not sin only because it has no free will. So this leads into another question that sometimes gets brought up when atheism is introduced. Where... From where do we derive our morals? One of the biggest mistakes one could make when discussing morality with an atheist is assuming that since atheists don't believe in God, then they have no morals. Now this is a common mistake, a common trap, and don't fall into it. One can be an atheist and yet have high moral moral character. And I'll explain... Give me some time to explain. I know some of you are probably chomping at the bit. Give me a couple minutes to explain. The popular atheist website askanatheist.org regarding this wrote, While theists believe that God will punish them for immoral acts and reward them for moral acts, atheists have no motivation to be moral other than their own innate sense of morality. It is morality for its own sake, not out of fear for punishment or desire for reward. You see, this is great, but there is a source from where our moral our moral character derives. In the atheistic worldview, morals derive from wanting to help humanity instead of a motivation for heaven in the next life. At least that's what they'll tell you. Popular atheists claim that goodness is embedded in all of us, and a lack of morality is caused by being selfish. The claim is that our conscience is the barrier that keeps us from breaking regular moral norms. However, there are, many, um, there are many among us that don't have the same moral standard. Now, there was a book written by Martha Stout titled The Sociopath Next Door, and she had this to say. It is estimated that one in every 25 people is a sociopath, or is someone who does not possess the normal empathy and conscience that other people have. The Christian would say that the conscience is a supernatural regulator of moral behavior. In his encyclical, Pope Pope, uh, John Paul II, in his encyclical, Veritatis Splendor, wrote, 
Bonaventure said that conscience was like a herald who blew a loud trumpet to announce the king was coming. So basically a finite being who is a product of chance, according to the atheistic worldview, is unable to be the source of morality. You see, if we're a product of chance, there's no way that we could be the source of morality. This is shown, we see this, by the different standards of moral conduct present in today's world. When we compare these different and various morality codes, it becomes very evident that the individual cannot be the cause. Christians have an answer. The Christian answer to this debate is that God has established a moral compass in all of us. This is why we're able to make a determination between right and wrong, even if we didn't have the best parents. God's moral standard is contained in the Holy Scriptures for us to study and learn from. There's no denying that there are moral people who are not Christians. However, the Christian worldview does not state that one must be a Christian to be moral. It simply states that the moral code comes from something higher than ourselves, and that something must be God. So next question that I want to discuss in our next few minutes here. Does God exist? The atheistic arguments against God's existence, may be, we can classify them into two groups. These two groups are what's called, what are called priori arguments and posteriori arguments. A priori argument for atheists, for the atheists claim that there is, they claim that there is some logical contradiction in the theistic conception of God. And because there is some contradiction, it's impossible that such a being can exist. A posteriori argument for atheism, that argument claims that the world is other than it would be if God existed. And so because of that, they conclude that there's no God. A good example of a posterior argument would be the problem of evil, which I touched on briefly just a couple minutes ago. Atheists commonly put forth a series of philosophical questions that, at least in their mind, disprove the existence of God. One of the most popular is that of the paradox of the stone. At its, at its core, the reasoning in this question creates a straw man argument. The argument is the following. It goes like this. Can God create a stone so heavy that he can't lift it? Either he can or he can't. If he can't, so the argument goes, then there is something that he cannot do, namely create the stone, and therefore he's not omnipotent. If he can, this argument continues, then there is also something that he can't do, namely lift the stone, and therefore he's not omnipotent. Either way, then, God is not omnipotent. A being that is not omnipotent, though, is not God. God, therefore, does not exist. Now, for this to be a true argument, for this to be true, the argument would have to prove that there is sufficient reason for something to exist. The statement assumes that once the, once the impossible is eliminated, in this case God, we just cannot say there is no explanation at all. This process of elimination forces us to accept even an unlikely explanation, because everything that exists must have an explanation. The Christian would then have to ask what God's sufficient reason is. And to clarify the argument, for sufficient reason, does not say that everything must be proved by the existence of something else. This would result in an endless, in an endless circle of reasoning. One of the premises of their argument is that something exists in itself or outside of itself. In the case of God, he is outside of space and time, so our finite minds, our cognitive minds, are not able to wrap our minds around that. An analogy of stones around a campfire may, may be helpful here. One may ask why those stones are warm. And of course they're warm because there's a fire. But why is the fire warm? The answer is because that is the nature of fire. And if it was not warm, it would not be fire. The paradox of the stone, though it's kind of entertaining to discuss, 
does not hold up to deductive or sufficient reasoning. And this is just, it's just not a plausible argument. Another favorite argument is what atheists call the ever-increasing diminishment of God. God does not exist because deities have been replaced by new ones throughout history. God is diminishing in popularity, therefore he must not exist. And soon a new deity will emerge. This is what atheists call the God of the gaps. Whatever gap there is in our understanding of the world, that's what God is supposedly responsible for. Wherever the empty spaces are in a coloring book, that's what gets filled. That's what gets filled in with a blue crayon called God. And that's according to the website alternate.org. Now, to be honest, the God of the Gaps theory gets presented as a way to cover our own ignorance of the natural world. The worldview of atheists is to look at the natural world and look for various reasons why things are the way they are. They look for answers that favor naturalism, even though divine intervention may be a much better explanation. From an apologetic standpoint, the Christian... Guys, it would be wise to have a basic knowledge of the natural world. The origins of the universe is a good example to start with. In the atheist worldview, the universe came from nothing. In this view, God differs little from... God differs little from nothing, so nothing still could have created the universe. However, this directly contradicts a basic law of physics, which states that something is unable to come from nothing. If nothing created the universe, then it came from something that is indistinguishable from nothing at all. The Christian worldview answers like this, and it's, and it's a logical conclusion to the question of origin. If one looks at the evidence objectively, and without preconceived notions, it is acceptable and reasonable to conclude that it is God who is the origin of everything. Guys, every week at the top of the show, I say where the hope within gets its name from. And it gets it from 1 Peter 3.15, which says, But in your hearts honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect. When we're talking with atheists, with atheists, it is very easy to get frustrated. It's very easy to get frustrated when a passionate atheist is asking questions and they're not being satisfied by our responses. As scripture says, we must always be ready to defend our faith, but we must do it with love. Think back before you were a Christian. Many of us were seeking, were looking for truth before we found the truth in Christianity, before we found that truth in Christ. Now, this is the same for many in the atheist movement. At at this particular point in their life, at that point in their life, the conversation with us may have been the only Bible that they've ever read. So let's be a good translation. The Christian worldview has an answer for what atheists talk about. Now, quoting scripture, this is going to sound bizarre, doesn't do a whole lot of good when discussing God with an atheist because to them it's not an inspired writing. That's not to say that we shouldn't use scripture because it, the Holy Spirit can use it to plant seeds. To gain ground with atheists, we must also use the natural world and philosophy in our defense. Nature and philosophy actually agree with Christianity. They're not enemies. Don't be afraid of them. There are many arguments that I haven't touched upon. I only have a certain amount of time to do this show every week. But I, I encourage you to you know, look at the resurrection and the ontological argument from, Saint Tom, from Thomas Aquinas that's also beneficial in dealing with atheists. In addition to knowing these things, knowing those things will help strengthen our faith and deepen our faith in Jesus Christ. Atheists are not our enemy. They're misguided. They're, they're, they are definitely misguided people who need the truth shared with them in love. So let's bring the truth to them in baby steps. 
Hey guys, like I said, this is just a very, very, very brief summary and brief tips about atheism. There's more on my, on my there's more on my website theologystillmatters.com. A couple of resources I recommend. Uh, Trent Horn has a book called Answering Atheism. It's a great book. It's an easy read. He lays out all of these questions in great detail, and there's many more as well. Scott Hahn has a Scott Hahn has a great book as well called Answering the New Atheism. That's also a great resource. And there's also a papal encyclical titled Veritatis Splendor, The Splendor of Truth, which deals with atheism and moral relativism, which is also a great resource. And it's written for all Christians. Yes, it's written by the Pope, but it's not just a Catholic document. It's written for um, all Christians. A lot of great resources out there um, when discussing atheism. Guys, and also, uh, The Hope Within is a listener-supported show. So if you want to donate to the show... Uh, please do. I'd greatly appreciate it. Uh, donate via PayPal. And my PayPal email address is William.Hemsworth at gmail.com. And as always, I thank you for listening to the show each and every Wednesday. Please check out, follow us on Twitter at within underscore hope or the Facebook page at heart at the, at hope within radio. God bless you guys. Thank you so much for listening. Have a great day.